psychology of contentment and also psychology of discontentment, incidentally. Now, coming to one subject, <coughs> if you want to get an idea of what it means to experience inner contentment, you can find from your own life. Suppose we do some noble deed without any selfish motive, including coming to a place like this or any spiritual place in any tradition and do some unselfish service. Either it may be cooking in the kitchen here, arranging the chairs, or contacting people. It could be in any tradition. Now when you do that, what do you get actually? It, no, there is a statement in Sanskrit, Prayojanam Anuddhisya Namantopi Pravartade. It's a statement, it means nobody, nobody could do anything, nobody does anything without any purpose. It may not be selfish purpose, but even after doing the most unselfish, the most um, uh, broad-minded, activity without any motive we get something out of it we may not be going for it we may not be seeking that but we get it a kind of inner contentment when you do some service some work uh, for helping others for helping people in distress or doing some kind of an act of service for uh, any noble purpose, you get a kind of inner satisfaction. Without this, we won't be doing anything. Suppose you go on doing some very unselfish, wonderful things and you get a lot of pain only, you won't be doing it, in fact. It's the fuel that keeps you moving forward, that keeps the momentum intact. That's why you find all over the world, big captains of industry, billionaires and philanthropists. After making a lot of money, maybe through questionable means, the early stages, and after some stage, after reaching some level of prosperity, success and achievement, they start starting foundations, trusts for helping, uh, you know, fighting Ebola, AIDS and epidemic diseases in the Sub-Saharan countries, backward parts of the world. How do they do that? Because they feel they need to do that. Otherwise, they can't survive. They can't even live, actually. So, there is always a tendency for us to fo move forward. And after doing this, they get a kind of inner satisfaction. You have to use that word for want of a better term in language. And for that they are doing it. When they give donation, big donation, or start a foundation or a trust for um, helping people in distress, uh, facing calamities, natural calamities, epidemics. After, uh, after doing this, they get a kind of inner fulfillment. For that they are doing it. They may not be karma yogis in the classic sense of the term. They may not be spiritual seekers, spiritual aspirants in the conventional sense of the term. They may not even believe in God. There are many wonderful people, humanists, who are agnostics, who do wonderful things for others. If you ask them, why, why are you helping? They may not be believing in God, believing in God, or they may not have any faith in a transcendental moral authority. But still they do that. Because out of that they derive something, certainly. This is contentment. And for, have, for enjoying this contentment, you don't even have to believe in God. Because it's a spiritual um, asset, spiritual capital that we accumulate by doing good deeds. And this in many ways could happen even when you think a noble thought. You get a kind of inner contentment. 
if that activity is linked to any selfish purpose, you won't get that contentment. Because the contentment is what you get after doing this unselfish deed. If there is the slightest uh, bit of uh, selfish motive, then the contentment you won't get it. You lose it. So this is a classic example. So if anybody wants to get an idea of what contentment means in a purely psychological sense, this is an example. And this is not even linked to any religion or faith in God or anything. It's what really uh, we experience when we try to do some unselfish deed. But because this activity is not linked to a selfish motive, very often, as I said earlier, there, there's, a in, there's an invisible uh, binding, a link between what we do and its immediate consequences, results, and our concern for the results. Our concern for the results is the result of attachment or selfishness. When the concern is absent, contentment is the result. Contentment comes as a, um, as the, as the result of any of this unselfish deed, thought, or word. This is a classic example. <clears throat> now, very often we have one problem, and that is related to pragmatism or utilitarianism. That is, uh, we sometimes want a complete, thorough analysis of how this happens. We want a GPS system in spiritual life, so to speak. So sometimes we encounter, I have encountered on many occasions, questions, well, after this what? After this what? So it means, suppose we uh, try to explain any spiritual sadhana, you know, spiritual practice, may very often uh, people ask questions, well, after practicing for some years, what happens? But what happens after practicing for some years? cannot be intellectually explained, but can only be internally experienced, really speaking. So, in a, you, you know, in a, when you drive from one place to another, you can have a clear GPS system. You know which way to go, you know what, where to reach first and then what's the next stage. But in spiritual life, it is, it's, it's a different rule. It doesn't function that way. Because we may be able to control the most complicated machine, but we, were, we have no idea how our own mind is going to work next moment. See, we, we, can, um, we can be very sure, we can determine how a very complex machine is going to function. Because the machine borrows its intelligence from us. But uh, we can never be sure what thought is going to emerge in our mind next moment. This is no control. So very often in spiritual life, we ask questions. In fact, this questioning, doubts, as, um, and then constant inquiry has got two aspects. One, in its positive aspect that takes you beyond it. And the other, the negative aspect that keeps you rotating along the wheel of questioning. So, one uh, comes out of intellectual arrogance, the other uh, is rooted in sincere eagerness to know, to evolve, to go beyond, to go, go ahead. So, one is like a wheel, you know, when you rotate along the wheel, you never come out of it. You are always within the wheel, you are rotating along with the wheel. The other, uh, the, the other one is like a straight line progression. So, real intellectual questioning which is part of spiritual life takes us beyond doubt on the other hand uh, skeptical approach skeptical uh, skeptical attitude uh, will keep us rotating along the wheel i can give one example from the life of sri ramakrishna and vivekananda you know, Swami Vivekananda was an agnostic actually. When he was going to Scottish Church College, he was an agnostic. He didn't even believe in God. 
Of course, it's, it's wrong to say that he was an atheist. But it, it may not be a fact to say that he was a conventional believer in God. He, because very often he doubted. He, in fact, once he walked and was got tired, he sat until the Octillony Monument and he said, oh, what a terrible world. If um, I could have made a better world than this. So he, he was questioning the, even the intelligence of God created this world. So he was an agnostic. And Sri Ramakrishna liked him all the more because he was an agnostic. So he used to ask Sri Ramakrishna questions. Sri Ramakrishna didn't mind because he understood that Swami Vivekananda's inquiries and doubts were rooted in his thirst, in his hunger to know more, to evolve. So a sincere inquiry will take us beyond doubt, beyond skepticism, beyond itself. But very often doubts will arise in our mind and these doubts may not be rooted in a very sincere, eager thirst for knowledge. In fact, this may not be a conscious phenomenon. In, act, in life, mind plays many funny trips. You find many problems arise when you become a spiritual seeker. If you are living the world, these problems don't arise. So very often, you know, spiritual practice is sometimes compared to uh, to the uh, the uh, efforts of a person who is trying to clean up a lake, so a lake uh, which is uh, let us say hundred feet deep, uh, only at the surface you get pure water. Below you uh, it may be ninety five feet different layers of mud, weeds and bacteria and many such things. You know. So when you take a long pole, long stick and try to steer it, all these bacteria and mud and dirt will come to the surface. But that's only the process of cleaning up the lake. But if you don't disturb the lake, it remains dirty and filthy, but then it never gets clean, so there is no disturbance. So if we don't, if we don't make any effort to open a new chapter in our life, to start spiritual life, there will be no doubts, no skepticism. Skepticism and doubt sometimes emerge the moment we start a sincere inquiry. In fact, that's one green signal that shows that we are on the right track. So we have to keep this, this, keep this, keep in mind the tendency of the mind to move like a wheel that goes on rotating and keeping us as part of this rotating wheel, never permitting, never allowing us to come out of it. So doubts are of two types: sincere eager doubts that that is the that helps you in your momentum the other doubt which is uh, which keeps us rotating along with the wheel never permitting us to come out and leads to skepticism doubt and frequently uh, the pendulum moves to the other extreme uh, we feel well the spiritual inquiries religion all these are uh, meaningless things so one point we have to keep in mind, especially those who look for contentment, is it should be made on, it should be built upon sincere uh, inquiry for knowing the truth and for evolving beyond doubts and skepticism. So that's one thing. And how do we achieve this contentment? As I said, the thread that connects our action and its result should be severed. That's the first process. And then we won't be concerned. Then we won't be anxious. We won't be obsessed with the result. So long as we remain concerned about what results are going to emerge, what results we are going to get, in what way we are going to be benefited by our actions, there can be no contentment. And that's, and that could be understood when we keep this in mind. There is no GPS system in spiritual life. I know I have to drive home this idea with a few illustrations. <coughs> I can give an example. For example, very ordinary example. So suppose you go to a library. 
And this often happens. Or you go to a place, you listen to a wonderful lecture, a prayer, in church or synagogue or temple, anywhere. Let us say we read a book. And when we read that book, suddenly we are caught. This is, there are some wonderful ideas. One book that I can give from Christian tradition, example, is The Way of a Pilgrim, is written by, it's a kind of autobiography, written by a, a, a very ordinary person. He was a peasant. He lived in the 19th century. He was a member of the Russian Orthodox Church, not a monk or a priest, but a very ordinary person. He could barely read and write. And uh, is it, he, he, in fact, uh, the story of a Russian peasant. Uh, one day he went to uh, uh, a church in his village. It's a Russian Orthodox Church. They are very rigid, almost fanatical, but Russian Orthodox Church produced maybe the maximum number of mystics in Christian tradition. And not, uh, not dozens, scores of them. And the Philokalia, the number of Christian fathers, and there are so many. Anyway, I'm not going to those details. This is a very ordinary example. A, an ordinary Russian peasant. One day he went to his church, and remember this is not legend. Uh, he wrote uh, his own experiences in the form of an autobiography, and that was found in the in a manuscript form in Mount Ethos in Greece. The Greek and Greek and Russian Orthodox Church denominations are similar to each other in many ways, and uh, and interestingly, in the Russian Orthodox Church, they have many of these. Uh, traditions which they may have got from Hinduism through Buddhism because Buddhism was very popular in, in Central Asian Republics for quite a long time, several centuries. So um, one day he went to a church and he listened to a sermon. The sermon was, uh, was a description of um, unceasing prayer, continuous prayer how we can keep our mind in a state of perpetual, natural, effortless prayer, prayerful mood. So it comes from uh, St. Paul's first episode to Thessalonians. This man was not a biblical scholar. He was not so well educated, but he could write, read and write somewhat. So as he listened to this prayer, to his sermon on the first episode, only one sentence caught him. That is a sentence related to the secret of unceasing prayer, ceaseless prayer. How to keep our mind in a state of perpetual prayerfulness, so to speak. And he was interested. And he forgot everything else and he started his journey in search of a person who could teach him this technique of unceasing prayer. Mind you, you find unceasing prayer in the name of Ajaba Jaba in Dinaradiya Bhakti Sutras, Shandilya Bhakti Sutras, in Bhagavata Purana. There are long descriptions and definitions of unceasing prayer, continuous prayer. But anyway, so, so he started his journey. After traveling hundreds of miles along the big country, you know, in those days, it was before the emancipation of Serbs in Russia. So it was, it was a very totalitarian, very socially very backward uh, country, so uh, unlike the more um, politically and socially more advanced uh, West European countries like Britain, Sweden, and uh, Germany and other countries. So Russia was somewhat backward, semi-agrarian. In society, but it produced many great mystics in the Russian mystical tradition. So this man went his journey, and he want his his goal was to go to Jerusalem. That is it. So he 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 planned to walk all the way to Odessa, from the cross the sea, and then finally go to Jerusalem. And on the way, he was uh, ambushed. He was tortured. He was 
In fact, he didn't have anything with him, but still robbers tried to uh, take away the, the dry bread. That is the only thing that he carried in his bag. So, by begging, he lived by begging. And uh, at one stage in his travels, he met a Christian monk uh, who lived in a tiny cell in his monastery who offered to teach him the secret of unceasing prayer. So I'm just cutting a long story short as far as possible. But when he listened to this and when he learned this, he felt a complete satisfaction. I mean, he felt there was no need for him even to move further and go towards Jerusalem. Finally, he did not go to Jerusalem, he returned. But so the story, if you read it, you understand, when he learned from a, monk, from a monk, Russian Odor's monk, who allowed him to stay in his tiny cell for some time, alone, when he learned that, he felt a complete inner joy and satisfaction. So all the pains, fatigue, exhaustion associated with long travels, along forests, steppes, all that completely vanished. And then he said he felt a great compassion for the whole world. He kind of kind of inner fulfillment. You find many such examples in the devotional classics of Vedanta, Hinduism, Bhagavata Purana, Shantilya, Bhakti Sutras, and others. As I mentioned, Nityotsam Bhavati. So it comes from the Bhagavata Purana in describing the the internal contentment of Prakrata. Now, how this how did he reach this level of contentment? One may ask the question, can we have that kind of contentment in our daily life, living in a very complex, uh, very active, very competitive society where we have to work hard uh, every day for several hours? The answer is yes. And Bhagavad Gita gives a clue to uh, this question. So it talks about karma yoga. So karma is inevitable. Activity is unavoidable. And it is also true, it is also a fact that every form of activity has some problem. There is no activity without some problem of other. We may succeed in reaching the highest goal in some profession, but that success may not be always there. There is always changing, it's always fluctuating. So, so how to keep the mind in a state of uh, perpetual steadiness? For that activity should be joined with yoga. <coughs> so yoga brings in the spiritual element and the activity is already there. You know, Lord Krishna makes a statement in the Gita, we cannot keep quiet even for one kshana means one split second. Even if you are physically inactive, mentally, intellectually will be active, will be thinking. So we can never be in a state of perfect and complete mental, physical and psychological inactivity. It's impossible. And at the same time, as I said, Action is always linked to some problem of other. Not necessarily. Some actions produce 100% results, expected results, joyful results. But very often actions do not produce such result. So how to face this problem? So action should be linked to yoga. And when you combine action, that is karma, and yoga, it becomes karma yoga. So how do we link it through non-attachment? Non-attachment towards what? Non-attachment to the results, not non-attachment to the action. So that should be understood. You know. We are we Karma Yoga doesn't ask us to be non-attached to action. Non-attachment is only to the result of action. And this non-attachment should never be negligence or indifference or complacency towards the result. 
as I said, when we take away our concern and anxiety for the research, then we will be able to focus more energy and more attention on whatever work we are doing. Then the action produces more result, better result. So, in a way, uh, to use the American language, it is a win-win situation, so to speak. You gain both ways. So, when karma becomes karma yoga, through this mechanism of non-attachment, not to action, but to a resource of action, without being negligent, without being indifferent, it is called karma yoga. And this keeps our mind in a state of per 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 perpetual contentment. This is one important thing. Now I shall go back to the example that I mentioned earlier. Suppose you go to a library, take a book on a spiritual topic, or go to a lecture, uh, we uh, we, and we listen to some wonderful ideas and we may be impressed. Now, our state of mind after listening to the lecture, after reading the book and our state of mind before we stepped into the library will be totally different. This we often forget. That's a very interesting point. So we sit somewhere in an easy chair and we ask, well, what happens after some years of spiritual practice? In fact, with this mind, we are trying to analyze what would be our mental condition after practicing spirituality after some, for some years. It is totally foolish, really. It is totally irrational because the mind with which we will be uh, thinking about next step after some years will be totally different from the present state of our mind. That's why I said, no, there cannot be a GPS system in spiritual life. Because at every stage, we find our mind itself evolves. This we frequently forget when we think of problems. That's a very, very interesting um, uh, aspect that we very often we overlook or we forget. So, so when we uh, go on thinking about what happens next, what happens next, what, 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 will, what, what will be the next step. We forget that the next step will become obvious to us when we take the first step. When we take the first step, after completing the first phase of our spiritual evolution journey, the next phase becomes obvious, unlike in, in, in GPS system here. Here you can we can predict, you can determine from now itself how you are going from here to another place. But not in mental life, not in spiritual life. So, that is an important point to remember for those who want to cultivate contentment. Because discontentment is always rooted in perpetual skepticism and doubtfulness. Once we understand this is a problem, a natural problem of the mind, then the problem will no longer be a problem. See, problem is a problem when we don't realize, recognize it as a problem. When we recognize this as a natural play of the mind, then it will be no more a problem. So this is an important point we have to keep in mind. Another uh, serious impediment or obstacle in cultivating inner contentment is much more common. We often uh, draw a line of demarcation, dividing line between secular and spiritual, between our ordinary life activities and problems and spiritual practice. So spiritual practice is something linked to the trees, prayers, reading or meditation, puja, whatever it may be. And life is something different. Now, uh, one uh, important method to cultivate inner contentment is to spiritualize the secular and not secularize the spiritual. That's also a pro problem, one of the problems. So sp how to spiritualize the secular? Again, we have to come back to the subject of contentment, sorry, karma yoga. As I said, 
action activity is part of our daily life profession and we cannot keep quiet for one split second mentally or physically even if you are physically inactive mentally you will be active and action is invariably linked to some problems I mean the uncertainty of the result that causes anxiety and that creates discontentment so how to um, uh, spiritualize the secular how to establish a link uh, from secular to spiritual and there is only one way looking upon every act as a spiritual phenomenon as a spiritual activity everything is spiritual because our mind is the same whether in secular life non spiritual life or spiritual life mind is always the same so how to spiritualize the secular looking upon every action as a kind of worship is it really possible we may teach in a university or working in an office driving the car all this can it be spiritual as spiritual as praying or meditating or doing puja it's a natural question may arise so many of our great spiritual teachers give the example that is uh, mentally link ourself the infinite looking upon all these uh, empirical duties and responsibilities as necessary but uh, simultaneously we must think of something beyond this the impermanence of the phenomenal world i know this is a metaphysical problem linked to advaita brahma satyam jagat mithya jivo brahm hivanapara this is the basic principle the world is mithya the world is not unreal but world is relative mithya doesn't mean unreal mithya doesn't mean imaginary or non existent mithya means the relative and relative means what is subject to changes and everyone can understand this the world is subject to change a profession of duty responsibilities all these are subject to changes so how to look upon all the duties and responsibilities that we are engaged in as part of the relative and how to link ourselves to the infinite from an intellectual point of view we can understand this you know this earth this cosmos itself is part of relativity in the sense it did not exist before big bang and you cease to exist after the big crunch if it was going to happen the cosmos itself is impermanent in the sense it had a beginning and therefore it will have an end this is a pure metaphysics and every well educated per- person in modern times will tell you this cosmos is subject to changes it can it doesn't remain it cannot remain in the same status quo condition for infinite time no it's not possible So what is beyond this impermanent relative phenomena? So Vedanta tells you Atman. This Vedanta tells you Atman and Brahman. As the immanent spiritual principle within us is called Atman. As the omnipresent transcendental reality is called Brahman. The same. Well, if we cannot believe Brahman God as infinite, immanent and omnipresent. We can think of one absolute reality that is beyond changes. Because the fact of change itself points to to something which is beyond changes. So, Vedanta tells you looking upon all our duties and responsibilities related to <coughs> life in this world as relative as impermanent is one way of linking ourselves to the permanent to the infinite once we do that then we'll be able to enjoy contentment 
In fact, that's what Lord Krishna meant. Sukham atindigam yetat buddhigrahim, buddhigrahim atindriyam. So the joy that is absolute, as I said, you know, as a coin with only one side, a joy which is really not the absence of pain, but joy itself positively, that joy is linked to the infinite. You can never be in a state of perpetual contentment if you live linked to this phenomenal relative world alone. Impossible. It doesn't mean that we should neglect the world. That should be kept in mind. A lot of criticism against Sattveda, Vedanta you find. Vedanta tells you this world is unreal. Which is ridiculous in a way. Vedanta never tells you this world is unreal. Vedanta tells you that this world is relative. In the sense impermanent. What's the meaning of impermanence or relativity? It is subject to changes. It doesn't remain the same condition for all times. Any more than our actions uh, do not produce the same expected result all the time. So, what Vedanta tells is, beyond and behind this relative changing phenomena, there is an infinite unchanging reality and that is what Vedanta postulates as Atman or Brahman. And that's our true nature. So, beyond the physical, beyond the intellectual, beyond the mental, we have a higher dimension to our personality. And that personality is the spiritual personality. So once we understand this, then contentment becomes possible. You know, very often the problem is, many things we try to believe. We think, I believe in God, I believe in all this. But in actual life, uh, our belief is not what it, it should be. I can give you an example. Now the time is, let us say, 10, say 11, 10. It's a fact. Can we believe in God with the same sense of reality with which we believe it is 10, it is 11, 10 now? So the reality of the real is different with regard to different things in the world. Say so this is Pittsburgh, there is no doubt about it. It's a reality. So God is real when we say believe in God. So believing in God is it as real, that is that belief as real as the belief that this is Pittsburgh. So you find the, there is a gradation of reality to the real. So one way of uh, cultivating contentment is to give a promotion to our, our, real, our concept of the real in spiritual matters. Very often, well, I believe God, God is real. It only means I want to believe that God is real. It is a like desire to believe. But that desire itself is sincere maybe, of course. If it is really real, then we all become mystics. But Sri Ramakrishna could not believe in this world, he could believe only in God. For ordinary spiritual seekers, it is difficult to believe in God because the world is so real. So you can see both the extremes. So in a very subjective sense, this is something that we often do not notice. When we try to believe in God, believe in spiritual values, it only means we want to believe in the reality of spiritual values. It's only a desire to believe. When we believe that it's Pittsburgh, it is real belief. So can we upgrade the reality of the real in which we try to believe? When we upgrade it, then contentment becomes real. That's why <coughs> making our actions and thoughts as unselfish as possible is one royal pathway towards contentment. As I said earlier, when we do something noble, even a noble thought, a noble idea, a noble activity, even when we try to help a person to cross the street, let's say a blind man, we help him to cross the street. 
we pay check. You send a check to uh, earthquake victims in some far off lands. That night you will be able to sleep better. That's why rich people do that. They are forced to do that. They may not admit it. Because that action produces a kind of inner vibration. That is contentment. And that contentment becomes real when our belief becomes more real. As I said, the reality of the real is a very important aspect in spiritual life. So, yoga alone can help us in upgrading the reality of the real. And this helps us to spiritualize the secular. And when we spiritualize the secular, then uh, the line of demarcation between secular and spiritual vanishes. And then contentment becomes real. Very often, if you put this idea before people, one very question that frequently they ask, what are the problems in life? See, when we are in a temple or a church or when we are engaged in some spiritual activity, feeling of inner contentment will come. But then problems and crises and challenges in life, in professional life, in economic life, social life, all this. Now here, there is a statement in one of our ancient scriptures. It comes in one of the Puranas. It addresses this problem. I shall quote this verse. Yesi anugraha michyami tasya vittam hara miham bandhavaischa viyogena prasham bhavadi dukkha dukkhida tena dukkena samtapto yadi nam yadi maam na parityaje tam prasadam karishyami yadevai rabi sudurlaha. It is a very interesting verse. How to confront problems and challenges in negative situations. So the statement of the of the verse, I mean this the classic is this. God tells you that when I when I want to help somebody, then I want I want to remove him from the path of obstacles and I want to remove the obstacles from his path. Say a rich man who was for some time a devotee and then he becomes too much concerned, too much obsessed with his wealth, proud of his wealth. So slowly he gets more attached to his money and wealth than to spiritual values. But if God wants to help him, then he turns him into a pauper. That's literally means. And then if we are very proud of great reputation, we become celebrities in society, and we become proud of that, it takes us away from spiritual path. That God gets ourselves isolated from everybody. So that we'll be, we'll be forced to turn to God. Or let us say to us higher values. When we are pressed by circumstances, when we are cornered by circumstances, we step aside and ask the question, well, is this all that we have got? Is there nothing beyond this bank balance, wealth, money, status, Medicare, insurance? There is nothing beyond this? Is there something else to my personality? I am in need of something more than all this. So this question we, we ask only when we are pressed by circumstances. So the verse tells you, if God wants to help you, then He puts you in such a situation, in a set of circumstances, where you'll be forced to open your eyes and ask the question, well, is there something beyond these visible things, beyond the, sec beyond the sense? sensual pleasures of secular things. Is there higher value? Or am I just this body or mind? Is there higher dimension to my personality? This question arises. Even if we have made some attempt in our life to ask this question, 
it will take us beyond it will help us at one stage or other in our life so one of our scriptures uh, illustrate this point with the help of a story the story is uh, is found in the bhagavata purana the story of a of an old man who was about to die now in his early days he was brought up as a god fearing boy till his reach his youth he was he led a very ideal life it is called ajamela ubakya and in bhagavata the story of ajamela this many commentaries so when he was young he was brought up as a god fearing person he led an ideal life he was an ideal son uh, he played the role of a son uh, to his parents and his brother to his other siblings in a ideal way <clears throat> but when he reached his middle age before he reached his middle age he had a deviation he had a fall and he fell into bad company bad associations and he became a profligate he became uh, what do you call it? Uh, at, at last, he was completely lost. He became lost. So he became a scourge to the people living around. He became a scourge to his own parents. Now he was about to die. He had become very old. So the story is this: when he was about to die. he became totally helpless now when you are in his, when you are facing the last moments you, even if you are a well trained diplomat you cannot smile because your natural instincts and accumulate some scars will come to the surface that's why in one of the upanishads there's a prayer the prayer of a dying man he tells himself oh mind please remember your good thoughts good ideas because i want to die with a peaceful mind so kridam smara kridam smara this is it is a long prayer to the end of the isavasi upanishad so dying man is addressing himself that is his mind so oh, mind please remember all the noble thoughts associated with good actions that you have done in the past so that i can die with a peaceful mind Okay, now this man Ajamila, that is the name. He was uh, about to die. He had a son, and his son's name was Narayana. Narayana is the name is a synonym of Vishnu, one of the Hindu holy trinities. In a way, it is a synonym of God. And actually, he didn't want to utter the name of God because he was so lost. and he had led such a loose profligate life had become such a scourge is big a great sinner so that he could not have called upon the name of god when he was about to die this to be a person reaches that stage of death his natural accumulated tendencies will come to the surface he cannot really hide his true nature so this man wanted to call his son whose name happened to be the same as narayana which is the synonym of god so as he called his son's name suddenly his mind went back to his early days because as a boy he was trained in spiritual practices taking the holy name of god narayana the same name which later he gave to his own son so that's how the coincidence took place so he did not really want to call upon the name of god he was calling his own son out of state of total helplessness was he going to die state of misery because all the evil companions with whom he was moving had left him he was in a state of total despair and he knew that he had led a very sinful life He was in a state of completely wretched mental condition. So he called upon the name of his son. 
But so next moment his mind went beyond that and he, his mind went back to the days, early days when he uh, used to chant the same holy name uh, as a part of his spiritual sadhana, spiritual practice. <coughs> so at that time God's angels appeared. Vishnu do I mean Vishnu's servants, so this is the angels, corresponding angels of Vishnu appeared before him and they want to take his soul to heaven, to the celestial holy abode of Vishnu. But some others had also come. They were the messengers from hell. You take him to hell because they were judging his life on the basis of his later activities. But the angels and the angels from heaven, let's say Vishnu's, Duda, Vishnu's messengers, and the messengers who came, who came from hell, they had a heated discussion, a debate. <laughs> Whether he deserved to go to hell or heaven. So they, in fact, eventually, the messengers who came from the abode of Vishnu won the case. They said, this man, at the last moment, had uttered the name of God. Therefore, he deserves to go to Heaven decided. Now, the point that I want to present before you is not whether he went to hell or heaven. The point is, he had practiced some kind of spiritual sadhanas during his early days and remained at the back of his mind, though he didn't want to recollect those experiences. He wanted only to call his son to his side in a state of total helplessness. But the name happened to be the same, so his mind went beyond his son's figure form. It went back to his own younger days when he used to take the same name as part of his spiritual practice. He used to do he used to chant the holy name of Narayana and say Yenpa. So and when that memory came back, his mind got linked to that memory. So it is said in the Vedantic tradition. Um, our next slide depends upon our thoughts and impressions in our mind with which we leave this body. Now people may tell you, in that case we can do whatever we want. At last moment we will think of some higher. <laughs> but it's not possible. Because <coughs> The impressions that emerge in our mind when the senses are free, completely weakened, when the mind itself is becoming shaky, then our natural tendencies and propensities will come to the surface. We may be well trained diplomats, but you've seen the picture of uh, Navy Chamberlain Hitler shaking hands, 1938. <laughs> um, Treaty. In politics and diplomacy, we can smile wonderfully and shake hands. But in our subjective life, this is not possible. In, subject, in our inner life, uh, the to, I mean, what we think at the last moment is the totality of all the thoughts that we have thought, all the deeds we have done the, in our whole life. So I shall. Uh, uh, I mean, elaborate upon this point in the next class because uh, there is a verse in our most obscure, one of the most difficult and one of the most fundamental uh, books called uh, Brahma Sutras. It's a long discussion and debate between Shankaracharya and Vyasa. Uh, I mean, the dynamics of human life and the dynamics of human mind with which we live, live this body and how to develop an appropriate mind that will naturally think of higher things, holy ideas, holy things when we leave this world. It's a very interesting discussion. Of course, I shall elaborate upon this point in the next session. 
no big can have interaction so you can ask questions the, because in the course of this conversation i may touch upon certain point which i didn't elaborate enough so you can uh, ask uh, what your questions what is my yeah. you said the universe and world is not mithya but relative huh? then exact what exactly is maya then yeah i, I will explain this okay now maya literally means that which in reality is relative but in our ignorance we mistake to be absolute i shall try to explain by analyzing these two words which which constitute the word maya ma literally in sanskrit grammar is a negating factor I mean, suppose I ask you, don't come here. I say, Ma, uh, don't go. Ma, get to the, you don't go. Ma, get to the, don't come. Ma, what do you do? Don't speak. It's an imperative order. No. I mean, negation. Ya is a pronoun. You don't use a pronoun unless there is something that you can call with proper noun. this that etc when i say this glass there should be glass then we can use this glass now how do you combine this two on the one hand ya relates to something is real ma negates the reality to give another illustration suppose you have got a thousand pots and pans made of clay you say there are 10000 clay pots and pans i say there is only clay what is the higher statement there is only clay that clay has taken 1000 different shapes and forms pots and pans and different so many things in reality there is only clay now if somebody says no each pot is different from each other pot Say pot is big. A small glass made of clay, small. Both are different because you don't use a big pot to drink water. You use a small glass. But you cannot use a small glass for storing water. They say they serve different purposes. They have got different names because they got different shapes. But these shapes, these names. and these different utilities is called in nama rupa buddhi vyavahara bheda means differences and distinctions in terms of names forms and utility these are related you break everything it becomes clay so before you made all these pots and pans they the clay only you break it then also it's clay so when they are different when do you think they are different they are different only when they sit in front of you one is a pot and another is a glass and things like that similarly the whole world the entire phenomenal world consists of plurality in terms of names forms and practical utilities and engagements but behind this plurality there is one reality so all these are real they are not unreal because if they are they were unreal you don't feel their experience you live in this world you can also this world is totally unreal so it is not totally unreal but it is not absolutely real if they are absolutely real then they will remain the same if they are absolutely unreal then you won't feel their experience even so pot pans all these different implements that you make out of clay for example they are not totally absolutely unreal in that case you don't see this variation plurality distinction changes in names and forms etc but that those changes are not absolutely real if they were absolutely real then if you break them still they'll be different from each other they are not different so maya literally means something which is actually relate to you but when we don't realize that fact we mistake them to be absolute So in your analogy, uh, the pot is mithya, clay is real. No, no, no. Pot is mithya. Mm. 
the distinction, the differences based on names and forms. Those distinctions and differences are mithya or maya because they are relative. What is relative? Relative means something that you experience but not absolutely real because if anything should be called to be absolutely real it should remain in the same condition in the past, present and future. This is called Trigala Abhadita Sapta means it should, and again it should not be subject to any change. It should remain the same. So in Vedanta only Brahman or Atman is the only absolute reality. It remains the same because it was never born, therefore it will yeah. never cease to be. That's idea. Thank you. Maharaj, huh? folks who are listening to you from all around the world, including downstairs, no, no. would like for you to please repeat. Yeah, I think your world is very small, I believe. The world, <laughs> the world is world. Anyway, um, uh, yeah. please repeat the question and they will, for the afternoon session onwards, have a microphone for the question. Answer. Okay, so the, I shall repeat the question to make it Thank clear. you. <laughs> Thank you. The question is, um, this, uh, this what, what's the meaning of Maya? And what's the meaning of relativity? <coughs> what is the absolutely real? What is the relative of real? That's the question. It's a, an important topic in Vedanta. So in, in short, once more I repeat, Maya is something that is actually real, but the mistake that re relatively real to be absolutely real. And why do we make the statement? Because people frequently mistake the relative to, the, to be the absolute. So it is called, you know, Vajaram Panam Vigaro Namadheyam Mutti Gittiva Satyam. It's a statement in the Chandogya Upanishad, sixth chapter, Tattvamasi is being expanded. The dialogue between, uh, I mean, Uddhalaga and Shweta Ketu. So. When a person reaches the Sita Pragna stage, yeah. Does he see any change in the world that he perceived, that he saw before he became a Siddha Pragna? Well, uh, you, if you ask the question, well, the question is, uh, when a spiritual seeker becomes a Siddha Pragna, uh, does he see the world differently from what he saw before he became a Siddha Pragna? Well, uh, when his uh, mind reaches that state of steadiness, spiritual steadiness or equanimity, he looks upon the world as relative. And he doesn't run away from the world. Yes, the prajna also will be intensely sensitive. He will help people living this world, but he won't be in the world. He can live in this world without being in the world. He can live in this world without being worldly minded. So, because he will look upon the world from a higher perspective. So that perspective enables him to look upon this world as world. But if you are not becoming the Prajna, he may look upon this world as the real thing, as the reality. When he becomes a Siddha Prajna, he can see the world for what it is. It is only relative, changing, phenomenal uh, form of relativity. So, Maharaj, uh, spiritualizing the secular, like you had talked about, is it more of a thought or, uh, you know, can it be also uh, put into action? Like, Spiritualizing the secular or something, you know, uh, in the course of our work, if someone has to do something yeah. which is uh, so justifying, so spiritualizing can end up being justifying something, uh, you know, doing selfish or uh, how can it be put into no, action? It, yeah, you know, the question is, is uh, spiritualizing the world mean, does it mean, uh, is it a concept, is it just a word or is it an attitude, is a matter of inner experience? Well, you have to begin with. Uh, with an attitude. At the very beginning we may look upon 
spiritualizing the world, spiritualizing the secular as a higher concept for us to reach. The, and we can cultivate intellectually once we understand the impermanent nature of the relative world. That itself will give you a great sense of inner tranquility and peace. When there are problems and challenges, when they are when they threaten to disturb your inner tranquility and peace, then you can tell your mind, oh well, why am I cons getting concerned? This world can never be perfect. This world can never be permanent. How can this imperfect world be perfect? How can this impermanent world be permanent? So I'm looking for the permanent in this impermanent world. So that's wrong. This is how even a great idea or a concept can help you at the beginning. But as you meditate in spiritual life, as you reach a higher level of evolution, this is no more a concept for you. You realize it's a fact of inner experience. And such a person is called the Prajna, as I mentioned here. So uh, we should remember at the very beginning, we can look upon this as a great, grand, very rational idea. Every well-educated person can realize the relativity of this world. The world will not remain the same throughout. It has never remained. So it's a fact. Any physicist, any student of physics uh, can tell you. A geology can tell you. It's a fact. But then we frequently forget that. So in life, when there is a problem, in a professional life, in social life, in family life, suddenly we lose our sleep, we, we get ourselves disturbed. Because, oh, I, I did so much, this is the result. How, how can you be sure that your actions will produce the expected desired result? It never happens. So, once you take this idea um, as a very rational approach, towards problems of this world, then the problems won't disturb you. But in spiritual life, as you evolve further, you experience the reality of the impermanence of this world. Such a person is called Sthita Prajna. So, Sthita Prajna Yasyasa, a person whose Prajna, state of wisdom, is always in a state of complete steadiness, economy. So that's the, that's the state that one reaches in terms of spiritual experience. Even as a concept, it's a great help. I didn't have a chance to ask you this yesterday. You referenced to the dark soul, dark night of the soul. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, is that a spiritual crisis that every spiritual seeker goes through, or is it just selective to some? It may not necessarily, okay, so what's the, uh, I mean there's a request to explain the night of the soul that we described yesterday. Well, you know, not necessarily every spiritual seeker, as you mentioned. Um, many go through this phase, but it is not a necessary condition that every great spiritual seeker has to go through this stage. So, in, uh, you, you can find this in the, in the lives of uh, Catholic mystic, or also in the national religious mystics, and also in, in the Vedantic Hindu mystic tradition. Now, at one stage, uh, after making some progress in spiritual life, we reach a point, it's almost like a dead end, um, well, as if a kind of inner voidness, emptiness, it could be one form of experience or problems arise and we find I prayed for so long, so this is the result. Uh, you know, such sometimes I worked so hard, this is the result. So, such a situation will arise. In fact, uh, that phase is, from one perspective, it shows that you are on the right track. Because that's an, that is a natural state of transition. I mean, from 
one state of spiritual uh, journey to another state. Because that's a test that we have to go through. So in the verse I quoted, you know, Tena dukhena samtattu idin maam na parityaji. So in the verse which I quoted, uh, which is, Yesi anugraha vichyami tasavittam harami. If God wants to help you, and if he finds that you have become so proud of your wealth, then he finds it's necessary that you should have a taste of poverty. So he turns you to pauper. So, but God doesn't turn everyone to pauper, then people won't turn to him, of course. <laughs> but there are higher seekers, higher spiritual seekers, who are very steadfast. For them, this wealth becomes a, an obstacle. If that is removed, or the attachment to obsession with wealth or reputation, worldly pleasures is removed, it will give a quantum leap in their spiritual, great progression. So for that purpose, God removes that obstacle from his or her path. That's what it means. Still, if you persist in your spiritual practice, then you will be elevated to such a position that you will be the envy of angels. Uh, that's why Still you don't desert God. Then Prasadam Karishyami Yet Devairapi Sudulam. Then I shall elevate him to such a position or her to such a position that it be you'd be your position will be higher than the angels. No. Um, sincere seekers frequently have to uh, go through not this is not necessary condition there will be many who are exceptions but very frequently sincere seekers have to go through this stage as a part of uh, learning, curve. learning more and also is spiritual exercise see if you walk uphill you become it's better for your heart than walking downhill or walking plain uh, there are hurdles yeah it's a great it's a better exercise if you if there are hurdles, if you walk uphill, it's far it's a far better exercise than walking through soft plain ground. So very very frequently you find you can you can I can give an example of in Sida Mushma's life, Swamiji's life. So Sida Mushma makes one point in one con he makes a point that you know Swami Vivekananda became such a humanist uh, with all his spiritual Vedantic scholarship, he was a great teacher, exponent, but along with all that he was a great humanist. He was a great lover of human <coughs> beings, his compassion for people uh, who were deprived of classes, uh, he, his, dis I mean his promotion of education among the downtrodden people and all that, you know, and his, uh, his uh, promotion of philanthropic activities, all that. Now, Sri Ramakrishna says, because he had a little bit of his own experience during his life. He had to go through uh, these difficult periods after, his, after the passing away of his father. So, in the lives of great spiritual seekers, sometimes, as you said, it may be a learning session for them. I mean, to complete their mission, they need <coughs> intimate knowledge of certain aspects of human life. Uh, which otherwise they would not have. Sri yes. Ramakrishna makes that point. So Narayan became so kind-hearted and compassionate because he had to go through some of these problems himself in his own uh, fam I mean, domestic life after the passing away of his father. Sri Ramakrishna makes that point. But it's not a necessary condition. Uh, you should not put it that way. It's not mentioned as a necessary condition. We are only trying to explain the phenomenon of this happening in the lives of many great spiritual seekers. So it's the other way around. Every spiritual seeker should go through the phase. No. From another perspective, we are trying to find a logical explanation to this um, inexplicable phenomenon. The many great spiritual seekers, though maybe praying all the time, have to go through these stages, this idea.
Maharaj, oftentimes uh, it's no, no one becomes a spiritual. I mean, by birth or by nature, they are not spiritual seekers, but they are just seeking happiness, and they are not seeking contentment. And how do you how do you develop uh, an idea of wanting contentment rather than happiness? Well, you know, the question is, uh, no one it, it could be a spiritual seeker from the birth. No, there are many who are I mean, great I spiritual know. seekers right from the birth. Yeah. There are many who cannot seek for anything else other than God or higher values from the mm. very birth. There are many. Uh, we have to remember, here again, you know, uh, your birth is not the beginning of your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is only the beginning of this life. Right? So that should be understood. You know, Vedanta cannot be fully understood, even intellectually conceived, without uh, remembering this doctrine of reincarnation. Because if life is just one chance you get, it's like in Olympic, how cruel it is. You to jump, you should uh, reach the highest at <laughs> <laughs> one chance, otherwise you will be disqualified. So that's one major uh, difference between Abrahamic traditions and Vedanta Yoga. Um, no, I, I meant in the so so not in the yeah so the right like no. in, in in your secular life yeah yeah uh, that's true that's true you know as you said as you said you know people do not really seek contentment they, they seek happiness very frequently when they confront the reality of impermanence of the called happiness then they start looking for permanent happiness. They are looking for happiness, but when they are faced with the problem of impermanence, the impermanence of happiness, then they look for a variety of happiness that could be permanent or less impermanent. And then they look for something higher. That's why I said, you know, a rich uh, billionaire who made a lot of money in business lot of reputation. It doesn't happen to everyone. So again you have to remember, you have to think of the past life. So s there are many such people who suddenly uh, uh, start a new phase in their life. And they start looking for doing noble deeds, philanthropic activities. At the beginning of their life, they may have made money and they may have thought the money and profits will bring happiness. But at, at the later phase of their life, they, they start looking for a higher form of happiness. That is not the happiness of making profits or accumulating wealth. Because they are losing wealth when they are looking for higher form of happiness. You can donate money and start in philanthropic activities. So you can find a transition, an evolution, even in your concept of happiness. Mm -hmm. So we are looking for happiness. So in our concept of happiness also there is a progression. Actually, we are all looking for some kind of happiness and satisfaction. Great <laughs> spiritual teachers were also looking for it. <laughs> but their happiness was different from the happiness of worldly minded people. They were looking for happiness of a different type. They would be happy when others are happy. They would be happy if they could do something for making others happy. So, there is an evolution uh, even in the concept of happiness, as you said. From happiness to contentment, in, in ordinary life, as I said, when we, are fa when we are faced with the inadequacies of impermanence of happiness in the ordinary sense of the term, then we start looking for different and a higher type of happiness, which we call contentment. Contentment is also a kind of happiness. Only difference is there is a spiritual element in it. Because uh, higher contentment uh, can never be gained unless we practice some degree of unselfishness, some degree of non-attachment. Without that, contentment is not possible. 
even in as i said in you know, the great philanthropist who do a lot of work creating fund creating foundations and trust for helping people in distress and all that they are practicing a little bit of non attach from wealth that's why they are parting with it trust when you form if you convert if you form a trust out of your private funds you are sacrificing it means you are practicing non attachment Uh, we can less attached to that. So there is, as a transition, there is an evolution in our concept of happiness. Looking for a higher value and worrying for a higher cause is one kind of gaining contentment. If we can worry about some higher pro, higher cause. So in Patanjali Yoga system, we call pramana, tapa, so samskara dukkha. Three types of dukkhas are mentioned: pramana dukkha, tapa dukkha, and samskara dukkha. Pramana dukkha uh, means, say, sorry, parinama dukkha. Parinama dukkha, tapa dukkha, and samskara dukkha. So, parinama dukkha means when a yogi or a great spiritual seeker uh, feels sorry, even when everything is going. find for him it is not craziness remember that say buddha for example buddha was born a prince he lived in luxury so once when he was traveling the street he found a sick man a dead body an old man so all these uh, death and sickness he had never heard of these things he had never experienced these things so when he uh, experienced these three phases of negative phases unpleasant phases of human life real life then he start thinking um, well how to help people out of this he never thought there was such a thing as death because we are not allowed to come out and see any of the realities that you can read buddha's life because when buddha was born his uh, his father consulted an astrologer who predicted that he would become either an a great emperor or an emperor of uh, renouncers so he became an emperor among renouncers or became a great king he was a small king his father he saw so 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 that he was a small uh, king so father was very happy if he became a great emperor But also said that the astrologer predicted he may become a great saint or known sigma, which is not a very pleasant thing for the father to hear. So he was uh, confined to the palace, was not was not allowed to come out of the palace. He didn't face the reality of death, old age, or sickness. He had not even seen a dead man, a dead body, or a sick person, old person. So one day he came out and. he was traveling with his servant and then he found an old man a dead body being taken to the cremation ground and also a sick person and then he saw the face of an ascetic a saint and that is a different face all joy and happiness so he so he was looking he started thinking what's the reality of life so that night he left and he became the great buddha He left and walked across hundreds of miles, went to Bud Budhgaya and sat under the tree. Ika sani sushudhi me sari ram tagasti mamsam chivireyam chayatuhu aprapisidhim bhujad madurlabham naivasanat kaya madas chali shide. So find Ashokosha Buddha chali tha. Buddha sat under the tree with a strong vow: I won't get up from this seat till I have realized the supreme truth. Okay, now. What was the problem with Buddha? Well, it was not craziness. He had everything going in his favor. He was living in a palace. He had all comforts. There was no problem for him. Still, he was unhappy. This is called Parinama Dukkha. So Vyasa's commentary on Patanjali Yoga Sutras says the Parinama Dukkha is possible only for great yogis, great spiritual seekers. if you can worry about some higher causes then you are a noble hearted person 
If we worry about our own problems, then there is something very remarkable about us. We can worry about other people's problems. Even though we have no problem of our own, it is called Parinama Dukkha. And Vyasa in his commentary says, this Parinama Dukkha is possible only for great yogis. So, if you have a concern, if you have worry and anxiety, we can convert it into higher worry, higher anxiety for a noble cause. Then that doesn't uh, make us really uh, anxious. You may be worrying about uh, some earthquakes and all these problems, but that worry is different from worrying about our job, our money, etc. I can give you an example. Suppose you hear there is a big tsunami at the quake in a far off place, thousands of miles away from here. You may, uh, have, you may feel very sorry about this. So let's say thousands of people die in some natural calamities. You may feel very sorry about it and you may collect funds, you may do some, uh, you make some efforts to collect funds and try to help them in distress. But you don't go to your room and weep and cry unless you want to be certified by a psychiatrist. <laughs> so that worry is different from your private worries. So you can see that. We don't do that. We will be, we'll be very sorry for these people who are suffering. But that worry, that worry doesn't make us feel wretched. The way when we worry about our own small little problems. So the higher worry, worrying about a higher cause, about other people's problems, even when we have no problems of our own, that's the beginning of spiritual journey. It's called Parinama Dukkha in the Pandajali system and explained by Vyasa. So Vyasa says only great yogis can have this Parinama Dukkha, higher worry. So contentment in its one aspect is worrying for higher cause. That's an interesting thing. So contentment and worry do not go together. But if you can worry about a higher cause, a noble cause, that is also a kind of contentment. Though it may appear to be paradoxical, but in actual experience, it's a fact. Understanding of this question, it is that those uh, dark nights of the oh, soul yeah. is that one time only, oh. long, continuous, or can you go in and out of it okay. in the progress to perfection? Yeah, you know, in in spiritual life, this one stage where you reach uh, a, a state of uh, not distress, but you feel uh, stress and you feel inner void and you become skeptical whether you are really making progress or not. So the question is about this dark night of the soul. So normally it comes only once in one's life. But there could be problems from time to time. But once you uh, go beyond this phase, then you'd be equipped with a new spiritual weapon to deal with this problem. You, you feel spiritually enriched. It won't be any more a problem for you. So a genuine spiritual seeker may feel that he has reached a dead end 
uh, and he could not make any further progress and what to do. This feeling will come, but if he, could, if he persists in his spiritual practices, then he reaches a state where he can transcend it, and once he transcends it, he becomes spiritually wiser. In fact, when you transcend this phase of spiritual life, you evolve to a higher level. You become spiritually more reinforced. You will have a higher state of spiritual wisdom. Then you will learn to take it in your stride. It, it will no more be a problem for you. So that's why, that's what happens, you know. When it, it happens, in, it happened in, in, in the lives of many great saints. After they transcended that stage, uh, then the journey becomes smoother. Then whatever happens next, it won't be a problem for them. It's a kind of, as a certain learning curve, where you reach a state which is an opportunity for you to learn certain things, to evolve to a higher level of spiritual evolution. So shall we conclude now? We will continue. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shanti Shanti